Well, that's a very appropriate song for uh, us this morning as we are actually going to be observing two, uh, two, the two ordinances that we have. One is baptism and the other is the Lord's Supper. And so um, we've kind of woven the message this morning into our time of receiving the Lord's Supper today. So we're excited about that. I'm also excited that no one in the choir fell into the baptistry. <clears throat> You never know. There's a lot of people that like to make us flash, right? <laughs> if you need a Bible, these gentlemen would love to place one in your hands this morning. We are going to be looking at Joshua, that is the book of Joshua in the Old Testament. And this morning we are in chapter 7. We are in chapter 7. So Joshua chapter 7. Well, it's amazing as we have gone through this study of Joshua that there is so much victory to be spoken about. This has been just an entirely uh, different experience as we've gone through the scriptures. It's been absolutely wonderful to be able to see how the people of God uh, can avail themselves of the presence of the Lord. The presence of God is something that we should never underestimate. In fact, as you think about the presence of God, it was God who selected the people of Israel for himself. He drew these people to himself. He started with Abram, a man who lived far away from the promised land, and brought him into that land and wanted to have a relationship that is a spiritual relationship with the people of Israel, a people that would be unique from the other peoples of the world, a people group that would be set apart for God. They would observe what God says, they would seek to be obedient to God, and so thereby they would enjoy the presence of God. We even today seek the presence of God. We come here this morning as people of faith, people who have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ, and we strive to see the presence of the Lord on a daily basis in our lives. However, so often it's been in the history of the people of Israel that God was not there because they had walked away from him. God hadn't moved. God was still in the same place, but they had wandered off. It seems like the progression of sin is something that needs to be addressed in every single generation. I want to just provide for you a little bit of a backdrop here before we get into uh, this study here in Joshua chapter 7. For over in the New Testament in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, it tells us there in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 that in verse 6 it says, now these things happened. What things? Well, he begins by saying, for I don't want you to be unaware, brethren, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea. All were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and all the same spiritual food. And they all drank the same spiritual drink, for they were drinking from a spiritual rock, which followed them, and the rock was Christ. Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not well pleased, for they were laid low in the wilderness. That's speaking there about the people of Israel, who obviously came out of the land of Egypt, the reproach is rolled away later in Joshua, but until that point, the people had been hard-necked. They were stiff-necked against God, and God said, no, if you're going to rebel like that, if you're going to behave like that, you will not go into the promised land. And so they wander in the wilderness until that entire generation, save for Joseph, or Joshua and Caleb, are deceased. This is a generation of people that God is not well pleased with. And that's why verse 6 really stands out when it says, Now these things happened as examples for us, so that we would not crave evil things as they craved. And he goes on in verse 7, he says, Do not be idolaters as some of them were. And so we have this backdrop reminding us now in the New Testament age that we should be very careful how we approach the things of this world, that we're not an idolater as some of them were. This has been a great study so far in Joshua. Victory after victory after victory, and now I'm bummed because we're in chapter 7. 
I mean, this has been so cool. In chapter 5, we have Jericho looming, and we have Joshua, the appointed leader of the people of Israel, wandering about by, jo- by Jericho, wondering, no doubt, how this was all going to happen and how the word of God was going to be fulfilled. And who stands before him but a Christophany, which is the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ miraculously appears to him and lets him know under no uncertain terms that this is the Lord's battle and that he was there to win the victory. Whoo! And you know what happens. The walls come tumbling down. They, they come tumbling down and the victory is won by the people of Israel. There was some instruction along the way. Notice with me here in Joshua chapter 6 that there was a ban that was put in place. He says in verse 17, the city shall be under the ban. It and all that's in it belongs to the Lord. The only people that weren't going to be killed were the people, uh, Rahab and her family, because she was a person of faith and God agreed to spare her. And that was amazing. But the things that are there in the city, all that great spoil that was there was not to be touched by the Israelites. He says, keep for your, keep, Only keep yourselves from the things, he says, under the ban, so that you do not covet them, and you don't take of the things that are under the ban, and make the camp of Israel accursed, and bring trouble on it. We know and understand that's exactly what does happen, doesn't it? Because not everyone who goes into Jericho is persuaded to obey God and his word. Go with me to Joshua 7, verse 1. The sons of Israel acted unfaithfully in regard to the things under the ban. For Achan, the son of Carmi, he goes on and describes he's from Judah, and he had taken some of these things. He took some of the things under the ban. Therefore, the anger of the Lord burned against the sons of Israel. We have a problem now. It is so much more fun speaking on passages where there's not these problems. I have to tell you, I have been so stoked. But now here we are in chapter 7, and there's so much yuck that I have to deal with, it's going to take two Sundays. (laughs) Let's look to the Lord in prayer, shall we? God, we thank you for your leniency towards us, as demonstrated by your forgiveness of us, through the power of Jesus Christ. Lord, none of us deserve to be in your presence. None of us deserve to have the presence of God in our lives. We're a wayward people, just as our friends Israel are as well. We're reminded, Lord, that our sin natures are the same propensity to do that which is displeasing to you exists in all of our hearts, Lord. Father, I'm thankful that when we get through to the end of this, that there's victory despite these trials. So bless your word to our hearts, I pray today in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, you may remember, depending on how old you were, an old program that was on TV, and it went kind of like this. Spanning the globe to bring you the constant variety of sport, the thrill of victory, and the agony of defeat. You know, I've been watching that for a hundred years, and that guy still makes me cringe. (laughs) There he is, the, the great skier as he comes down the slope. Listen, kids, that was before ESPN. That's all the sports we had. Whatever they put on that hour show or whatever, you know, it was kind of like that was it. Um, but, but that was an interesting time, the thrill of victory, the agony of defeat. Well, we're dealing with the agony of defeat as we've read these first couple of verses here in Joshua chapter 7. We know that everything that God had placed under this ban, the Hebrew word being haram, it means a devoted thing. The haram meant to, to, to ban something or devote it to something, or it could be to destroy it utterly. And basically, the word is, is referring to um, exclusions for certain objects that were dedicated here to the Lord. Everything here in Jericho is under this ban with the exception of Rahab and her family. 
And the people of Israel heard the commands as they were passed down from God to Joshua, and Joshua got the word out to all of the people. Notice with me here that the Bible tells us right in the beginning of chapter 7, the sons of Israel acted unfaithfully. This is right off the heels of verse 27 in the previous chapter where it says, So the Lord was with Joshua, and his fame was in all the land. I want you to remember that verse of Scripture, and I want you to remember that there's no chapter breaks in the original. It flows right there from verse 27, and the highlight time here with verse 27 in Joshua, right into chapter 6 and verse one, or chapter 7 and verse 1, where the people of Israel are acting unfaithfully. Literally in the Hebrew, unfaithfully means to act underhandedly. They were acting in such a way that it was oftentimes this particular Hebrew word was used of marital infidelity. It was a sin here in this situation of, of spiritual infidelity. Being a friend of the world was really what was happening here with regard to Achan. Achan is identified here in this passage of Scripture, and we see his name there. And interestingly enough, the word Achan is kind of his name is kind of a play on words means trouble do you remember up above when god said if you take anything that is dedicated to me he says i'll make the camp of israel accursed and bring trouble upon it well literally trouble is upon it Achan, trouble he'd be buried in the valley of trouble this is who he is this is what has happened now and we find that it's fascinating to me as I look through this passage of Scripture because this sin that is mentioned here impacts the entire nation of Israel. Notice with me there in verse 2, or verse 1, at the very end of verse 1, you have that he says, Therefore, the anger of the Lord burned. Now, that's never a good thing. The anger of the Lord burns against whom? Sons of Israel. Do you notice that it doesn't say Achan and his family? It says the sons of Israel. Uh, there is a certain oneness among the people of God. And when one would sin and transgress the commandment of the Lord, it impacts everyone else. It impacts everything else. You can't separate them at all. You see, the problem is for Achan, he commits this sin and he brings trouble upon the people of Israel. But as he brings trouble upon the people of Israel, it's not only that God would judge Achan, but the consequences would be far-reaching. And so it is for us today, is it not? You may think that you have a relationship with God that's unique and that you can sin and there's no impact upon anyone else but you'd find that that's really not true as a body of believers those who have placed their faith in jesus christ we are interconnected are we not the body of christ suffers if one member in it suffers the scriptures are very clear about that and so we impact each other and so we need to be mindful that this sin is a very very serious issue now let me just go on to describe what happens here because we get the backdrop there and we see some of the things that are so important. But I want you to keep in mind the significance of sin. I want you to keep it in mind as the people of Israel go up to Ai. Ai is an interesting place. You'll see here that the Jordan River runs like this people of Israel, that's the red line. They come across from the eastern side of the Jordan, and they come, and they've already conquered in chapter 6, Jericho. Now they're going to look to dominate this central part before they go south and conquer, and then back north. They want to cut off the north from the south. Ai is a small town that is next in line. It is not a fortified city like Jericho was. A fortified city. Jericho at certain places the walls are over 40 feet high. There is no such walls to deal with at Jericho. And so in verse 2 it says Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai which is near 
Bethaven, east of Bethel. And he said to them, go up and spy out the land. So the men went up and they spied out Ai. They returned to Joshua and they said to him, do not let all the people go up. Only about two or 3,000 men need to go up to Ai. Do not make all the people toil up there, for they are few. So about 3,000 men from the people went up there. Now that sounds like a reasonable plan, doesn't it? I mean, we're not walking around the city seven times on the seventh day. I mean, it just seems like it's, this is the way to go, you know? Look, how many guys are up there? How many, seriously, how many guys are up there? Well, let's just go up there and pound them. Now you remember when the people of Israel crossed over the Jordan River, there were like 40,000 in battle array from just Manasseh alone. So you've got tons of people. In fact, there's over a million Jews who are now there camped in and around Gilgal and Jericho. How many people were in Jericho? You remember the acreage of Jericho? Eight and a half acres. How many people can you put on eight and a half acres? Well, they think it might have been several thousand people because people came in from the outlying areas and they packed that city tight. Well, when the city's destroyed, again, it's a million people against a few thousand. Here we have Ai, and there's even fewer people there. So this sounds like a decent enough plan. These guys come back, and they say, look, you know, there's only a few of them up there. I wouldn't send everybody. They, we don't need to all go up there. Let's just send 3,000 guys. And so the 3,000 guys, I'm not sure the problem was we didn't send enough men. But what ends up happening here is atrocious. For the Bible says that these 3,000 men in verse 4 went up, but they fled from the men of Ai. The, man, uh, the men of Ai struck down about 36 of their men and pursued them from the gate, that is the entering point of Ai, as far as Shabaram, and they struck them down on the descent. Whew. We have been enjoying all types of prosperity, and now this. How could this possibly happen? Can you imagine with me just for a moment being part of one of the million people that are down there on the plain and you're looking up there towards Ai. 3,000 of your men go up there to rout the little villagers that are rascals up there and they go on up there and instead they come running back down the hill. The Bible says there was a descent. They come running down the hill and as they're running down the hill... These 3,000, the men of Ai are catching up with some of them and striking them from behind and killing them dead. I wonder what got into those guys, why they were so petrified. So there you are among the million. And all of a sudden you look up there and you see, here's 3,000 guys. Ah! Ah! And they're running for their life. Help us, help us, help us. I mean, can you imagine that? You know that commercial where you have the meerkats running through the thing? I mean, I, that's what I'm mean, just kind of envisioning these 3,000 guys screaming at the top of their, go, oh, no, make them running down the hill. And some of them, this is tragic because there's three dozen of these men who are killed. There's possibly three dozen widows, and now there's fatherless children and, and all the rest. This is no small matter. When the captain of the Lord's army stood before Joshua and told him he was going to take care of everything and not one soul was lost taking Jericho, it's hard to believe that there were going to be anybody lost in this whole process of taking the promised land. But indeed, that's exactly what happened. And the results are horrific. Notice here what happens. The result of them coming down this hill, screaming at the top of their lungs, being killed from the men of Ai. He says, the hearts of the people melted and they became like water. All of the courage, all of the confidence in God, all of the faith that they had evaporates into thin air. And now these people are sitting there going, what do we have for hope? At this point in time, I think we would all agree that the leader, the people of Israel, needs to step up. The leader needs to step up. And who is the leader? But the leader is Joshua. Notice in verse 6 that Joshua tore his clothes, fell to the earth on his face before the ark of the Lord until evening. Both he and the elders of Israel, they put dust on their heads. So that's Joshua. That's his response. 
Joshua says, this is terrible. He rips his clothes. They throw ashes. He gets down on his face near the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant, thought to be very significant. Again, he's looking for the presence of God. This has been a terrible defeat. All the people are walking around now, wringing their hands. Oh, dear. Oh, my lippy. What are we going to do? Joshua, what are you going to do? The Bible says that Joshua says, alas, O Lord God. Now, this you know is going to be profound, right? Are you ready for this? I mean, this is profound. Alas, he says, O Lord God, why did you ever bring this people over the Jordan? Only to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us. I'm reading that. I'm like, what? Seriously? In the Hebrew, when he says, alas, it, it's like this, it's almost transliterated. It's like, ah, oh, Adonai, Yahweh, why did you take us out? So that we could be utterly destroyed. What a miserable response. Over in Numbers chapter 14, I want to just read for you the beginning of that chapter. This is where the congregation lifted up their voices and cried, and the people wept that night. All the sons of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron, and the whole congregation said to them, Would that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would that we had died in this wilderness. Why is the Lord bringing us into this land to fall by the sword? Does that sound familiar then, what Joshua is saying over here in chapter 7? Do you remember how much hot water the people of Israel in Numbers 14 that I just got through reading were in? They didn't get to go into the promised land because God says, that's it. You're all going to die. How many old people are there in the nation of Israel now in Joshua? Two. One old guy's name is Joshua. The other old guy's name is Caleb. Everybody else is young because the generation preceding died in the wilderness. And here is Joshua. He is one who has stood before the captain of the Lord's army. He is one that went out on a limb with an outrageous plan for victory as they march around the people, marches around Jericho, and then they all shout and the walls come tumbling down. Who does that? And wouldn't that build up your faith? Wouldn't you be excited about the Lord? And here you are now, there is a defeat, and you're on your face for an entire day, and you have the audacity to come to God and say, how could you do this, Lord? How could you do this to us? We should have stayed on the east side of the Jordan. There are actually three questions and two statements that are made here in this um, in this passage of scripture, and that is the first one. How, how could you do this to us, Lord? Why'd you, why'd you take us here? If only we'd be willing, the statement, only we'd be willing to, to dwell beyond the Jordan. Joshua is one of my favorite people. Can I just say this? One of my favorite people in all scripture. I just love Joshua. But I'm reminded that all of us tend to have Joshua type moments when things go sideways. And we oftentimes don't look for the answers to the problems in the right areas. We tend to do as Joshua has done here in questioning the wisdom of God. Now I would say to you that one of the things we have to remember is this isn't about Joshua nor is it about his plan. This is about God working his plan. Are you with me? Sometimes we think to ourselves, oh yeah, well what's the plan for the people of Israel? Um, God just wants to bring them into the promised land and bless the daylights out of them. And they're going to live happily ever after. Is that the plan? Or is there even something bigger than that? Well, I would submit to you that there is something bigger than that. And what's bigger than that is the fact that he was raising up a nation to himself so as to bring the Christ, the anointed one, through that nation Israel. And so there would be that righteous line that would be established. You see, God was doing more than just trying to bless these people. There was far more at stake. 
Joshua begins to do exactly what we tend to do. Because so oftentimes we rush to depression and discouragement just as quickly as he has here. It's easy for us to to forget about the blessings of God. It's easy for us to forget about the plan of God. We tend to have blinders on and look at it from our perspective and our perspective exclusively. We ask the same dumb questions. God, why did you do this in my life? We become discouraged, we get on our face before God and we're content to just stay there. Second question that he asks here in this passage, in verse eight he says, O Lord, what can I say since Israel has turned their backs before their enemies? Interesting question, what can I say? What am I going to be able to say to these people now? I'm their appointed leader, But how do I inspire confidence in them? How do I get them rallied up? How do we move ahead? How do we accomplish the things that you have for us? We've been put to flight. The other people, he makes the statement, the inhabitants of the land are going to hear about this and they'll surround us and they'll cut off our name. We're in deep trouble now. These nations that had nothing going for them, they were flat out discouraged after Jericho falls down, after the water is parted and and the people are crossing over in Jordan. I mean, these people are demoralized. Now they're emboldened. Now they have courage. Now we don't have courage. You see the significance of this one person's sin? And you can see the ripple effect, can't you? It's like throwing a stone in a pond. The ripple effect is going out and it is influencing all over the place in very, very negative ways. I give my man some credit here when he says, after that, he says, for the Canaanites, the inhabitants will hear of it. But that last statement, he says, and what will you do for your great name? It's almost like he comes around a little bit at that point. Joshua had made some mistakes. There's no question about it. When you look at this passage of Scripture, there's things that are sadly missing. There are things that that begs some serious questions. I don't see anywhere in the Scripture here where Joshua calls on the Lord and prays before going up there to Ai. Ai. Have you ever done things without praying yourself? Ever? Have you ever thought to yourself, well, you know, I I think I got this one, God. Jericho was a problem. Jericho, we need to consecrate ourselves. Jericho was an issue. That was one huge wall, Lord. But AI, not so much. I don't really need to pray about this. I can just... I can just handle it. I remember a time many years ago where an assistant pastor that was serving in the church I was in uh, had an issue. And I remember him coming into my office and sitting down and saying, Kevin, after this was discovered, it was such that he said, Kevin, I think I should resign. And it wasn't a, a slam dunk thing. It wasn't like, oh, yes, yeah, absolutely have to. And there had been situations like that, absolutely. But this wasn't one. And I really liked him. He was a friend. I I tried to encourage him. Just um, really loved him as a brother. When he said to me, you know, I need to resign. I said, no, no, no. I'm not going to have you resign. Let's work through this. Sometime after that, some things became a parent, and he was removed from the church. Caused a lot of harm in the body. Caused a lot of division among brothers and sisters in Christ, and it was a sad scenario. It was his sin, I could say. But the reality is, at the end of the day, and I shared this with the other leaders in the church, was that I was very quick to say, don't worry about it, we'll work it out. And what I should have said was, I need to pray about it. We need to pray about it. Because in looking back, it was clearly the thing to do. It would have been the 
best thing for him to have resigned. Would have saved the body of Christ their enormous struggle and difficulties. But because I wasn't quick to get on my face before the Lord and seek God's wisdom, I was part of all that. It's interesting, I should have really paid more attention to Joshua chapter 7. Really should have analyzed this a little closer to understand the importance of, of coming to God. The Bible says, if any of you lack wisdom, let him what? Ask of God, who gives to all men liberally, and he upbraids not. He doesn't scold you for asking. Isn't that great? If only you'd just come and ask the question. Joshua, if only you'd come and said, Lord, what shall we do now as we go up to Ai? God would have said to him, wait, you need to reconsecrate the people because there is sin in the camp. There's an issue that needs to be taken care of before you go up that little hill to Ai. And 36 people's lives are lost. There was a fatal mistake there with Joshua. There was also another mistake in the sense that he relied on the human wisdom of the spies that he sent up to check out the town. Isn't it amazing how he sends the spies up to do the legwork before he goes to prayer? He never does go to prayer that we see. Yeah, you guys go up and check it out and we'll, based upon your recommendation, we'll just charge ahead. I mean, let's stop and think about it. It was a crazy plan to go seven times around Jericho the last day and shout and let the trumpets blow and the place falls down. I mean, that's a crazy plan. It just makes so much more sense with this little town called Ai. Just rush the hill with 3,000 good guys. That wasn't God's plan, and he never asked. There also seems to be some overconfidence in their ability. Jericho's fallen down, things look great, and... He makes that mistake. Well, I'm here to tell you that that's a sad time in Joshua's life, and I'm certain that if he had to do it all again, he would do it much differently, as you and I would no doubt do things differently in our lives as well. But in verse 10, God calls him out. Gotta love this. The Lord said to Joshua in verse 10, rise up. Why is it that you've fallen down on your face? He said, well, God, I thought you'd be happy that I'm down here groveling around. Look, I got dust in my hair. I've torn my nice shirt. And it's not. He's like, get up. In the Hebrew, the word kum means to, to rise up and get off a prostate position and, and begin to prepare for action. It's used a, a number of times. It's It's great. God is saying, listen, you need to get up. You you need to get on the move. There's some things here that need to be addressed. You see, here's the problem. He says, Israel has sinned, and they have also transgressed my covenant, which I commanded them, and they have even taken some of the things under the ban, and both stolen and deceived. Moreover, they have also put them among their own things. Therefore, the sons of Israel cannot stand before their enemies. They turn their back before their enemies, for they have become accursed. I will not be with you anymore unless you destroy the things under the ban from your midst. Rise up, he says again. Get up. Consecrate the people and say, consecrate yourselves for tomorrow. For thus the Lord, the God of Israel, has said, there are things under the ban in your midst. O Israel, you cannot stand before your enemies until you've removed these things. How serious is the sin in the hearts of the people of Israel? These, this small group. How true it is when we think of the New Testament passage here in Corinthians. Don't you know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough? Clean out the old leaven, he says, that you may become a new lump. It's important. He says you've got to deal with this sin. The significance of sin is not to be understated. Now, if you were an Old Testament person living in Joshua's day, uh, you you. It would be easy to read the Bible through in a year. How many try to read the Bible through in a year? Anybody? Oh yeah, okay. You're way more spiritual than the first crowd, but don't let them, uh, don't ever let them get back to them. They were dozing when I asked the question. I know it. 
So I tell you now so that you can get your book lined up. I just got mine out. I'm going to read through again. Old Testament, New Testament, Psalms every day. It's just fantastic. Love it. it love it. Um, don't do it every year just like that, but, but it's, it's a great way to do that. It's always better to start now, get your book lined up so you can start January 1st and not wait till February because then you're like 30 days behind. That's always tough. But back in the Old Testament, they had, they had five books of the Bible that they needed to pay attention to. And one of those books, and this is where you all are going to groan, is Leviticus. Please turn there. <laughs> Say, really, Pastor Kevin, we're going to go to Leviticus? There has not been a message spoken in a church for a hundred miles that dealt with Leviticus. Leviticus isn't even relevant to us today. It's Old Testament. It's, 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 it's absolutely antiquated. This is, this is old stuff. Well, here's what I want to do. I, I just want to paint the picture for you so you understand something this morning. It's a lesson that we can all learn. I, I was reading through this, this passage, and it was fairly amazing to me as I was looking through. But he goes through, and these are the, the, the things that need to be done if someone is guilty. Notice verse 2 of chapter 5. It says, if, or if a person touches any unclean thing, carcass of an unclean beast, or the carcass of an unclean cattle, or carcass of unclean swarming things, though it's hidden from him and he is unclean, then he'll be guilty. Or if he touches human uncleanness of whatever sort, his uncleanness may be which he becomes unclean and it's hidden from him and then it comes to know it, he will be guilty. I mean, there's, there's some things there that you can stop and think about. In other words, somebody didn't know they did something wrong, then they find out either way they're guilty, they need to offer a sacrifice. Let's go a little further here to verse 15. When you'll see verse 15, um, you'll notice it says there, if a person acts unfaithfully and sins unintentionally against the Lord's holy things, he'll bring his guilt offering to the Lord, a ram without defect from the flock according to your valuation. So even if you were to sin unintentionally, there needed to be a sacrifice made for that sin. Now let's understand something right up front. The New Testament's very clear. The Old Testament's clear for that matter too. There is none of us here who is righteous. All of us come into this world with a sin nature and we are none righteous, no, not one, the Bible says, book of Romans. For all, the Bible says, have what? Sinned and fallen short of God's glory. That means we're all in a predicament having sin in our life. And sin is a, an enormous big deal. Let me just put it into a bigger picture for us as we've gone to Leviticus. And thank you for bearing with me in going to Leviticus. The broader sense of the book of Leviticus is to teach the people of Israel how to live in the midst of a holy God. I want to point out that people have never been asked to do that before. How do you live in the presence of a holy God? God wants to have a relationship with the people of Israel. They're going to build temples. His glory is going to dwell inside the temples. There was that tent of meeting that Moses went into. The presence of the Lord was, was there. How do we live in the midst of a holy God? I think that's a very reasonable question, don't you? Wouldn't you want to know that? And so that's why you come to Leviticus and you have all, all these passages that talk about this is what you need to do in this situation, this is what you need to do in this situation, and it's all because we need to know how to live. The passage here that we're talking about actually falls into a little smaller uh, literary context, and it basically deals with these purification offerings. Leviticus 4 deals with the leaders. Leviticus 5 deals with average people like us. How do we handle these defilements? How do we handle this? What if it happens by accident? What if it happens knowingly? And he outlines how to have a maintained relationship with God. Fast forward to 2016. We are not under the old covenant like the people of Israel were back in Leviticus. 
We still have sin, however, don't we? We still have that problem. All of sin comes short of the glory of God. The Bible says the wages of sin is what? Death. If you go back to that Old Testament, what did you find when a person sinned intentionally or unintentionally? You found sacrifices, and that meant death. Wages of sin is death. You come to the New Testament, you fill out the rest of that verse, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. You see, there's been one sacrifice that was made. Jesus Christ is that sacrifice. And now one of the most blessed verses of Scripture is if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And it's that process of forgiveness that keeps our relationship fresh and it keeps our relationship vibrant. So when we sin today, intentionally or unintentionally, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, our Lord. So let me ask you a question. Do you have that kind of relationship with Jesus Christ today? Have you placed your faith in Jesus Christ? Do you know that if you sin, what you do, whether you admit it or not, if you sin, your sins are forgiven under the new covenant, which is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ has made this possible for all of us. We can have that relationship to God and the presence of God in our life. My friends, as we go through uh, Joshua chapter seven, the one thing that stands out more and more and more is the fact that sin is an enormously serious issue. And because of the sin in our hearts, we would spend eternity in hell and not experience the blessings of heaven at all. But because we celebrate, and right now we're starting this Christmas season, we celebrate the coming of Jesus Christ, the incarnation of Christ. He's not just a man, he is God. And as God, he went to the cross, he hung there on the cross, and he took upon all of us our sin. And he paid for it fully there. One verse of scripture that are a couple verses of scripture that I'd like to just point out here before we partake of the Lord's Supper this morning. In that same passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, remember that verse I read, now these things happened as examples for us. In verse 14, he says, therefore, he's going to give us the reason for this discussion. He breaks it down and he's going to bring a synopsis. He says, therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. I speak as to wise men, you judge what I say, he says. Is not the cup of blessing which we bless a sharing in the blood of Christ? Is not the bread which we break a sharing in the body of Christ? Since there is one bread, we who are many are one body. For we all partake of the one bread, that is Jesus Christ. We are all invited to partake of the bread of life, Jesus Christ. If you've never placed your faith in Jesus Christ, what a great opportunity you can have. And calling on his name, the Bible says, if you call on his name, you will be saved. Saved from what? Saved from the consequences of our sin. Have you made that decision? It leads us to know that we're on our way to heaven because our way to heaven is not based upon our good works, the good things that we can do, the fact that I have eternal life that waits for me has nothing to do with Kevin. It has everything to do with Jesus Christ. What a joy, what a blessing it is to have that assurance. He tells us later in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let a man examine himself, and in so doing, he's to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Would you spend just a moment as we bow our heads before the Lord here this morning? God speaks to our hearts in various ways. Spend a moment in time as the men are coming to receive the Lord's Supper. Make certain that You have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ today. 
spend a moment in time examining your own heart before the Lord. Our brother Glenn's going to pray and ask the blessing on the bread that represents our Savior's body. Heavenly Father, thank you for the gift of your Son. Thank you, Father, that we have, because of that gift, we have a way that we can get into heaven. Lord, thank you because without that propitiation that you provided for us on Calvary, there's no way, Lord, that we can get into heaven. It's through your grace and through your mercy. So, Father, we are so thankful this morning for the body that you provided an unblemished lamb, Lord, that made a perfect sacrifice for us that we can enter heaven's gates because of, of your sacrifice. Thank you, Lord. Help us now as we remember and rededicate ourselves to serve you for Jesus. In Jesus' precious name we pray, and amen.